Thank you, Clerk Green. Uh, so can we go ahead and um, and call the roll, City Clerk? Yes. Alderman Ray. <laughs> Alderman Ray. <laughs> Alderman. F Aye. Alderman Fleming. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Braithwaite. I don't see him here. Uh, Alderman Wynn. Here. Alderman Wilson. Here. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Here. Alderman Sufferton. Here. Alderman. Here. We have a quorum. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Reed. Uh, so we have all our council members except for Alderman Braithwaite, and I think he'll uh, be joining us uh, shortly. Uh, so welcome everybody to the uh, Tuesday, September 8th special city council meeting. Uh, the only item on our agenda this evening is going to exec recess into executive session to discuss a couple matters. At the end of the meeting, uh, Alderman Wilson will be into executive session and uh, and uh, touch on, on a high level the issues that we're going in there to discuss. Um, before that, we'll follow the regular agenda as we norm as we normally do with any mayor announcements, uh, city manager announcement, clerk announcements, and then public comment. Uh, so the only announcement I want to make this evening is uh, that the condolences of the entire city are with the Weaver family who sadly lost their son, uh, C.J. Weaver, um, a week ago Sunday in a terrible accident on, in Lake Michigan. Um, there was a, a really nice community vigil at Dodge and Church last week, attended by many and put on by uh, Second Baptist Church and, and Reverend Neighbors and others. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of people um, um, you know, feeling for the for the weavers, um, just a remarkable family here in Evanston. Um, and so our prayers and our thoughts are with that family this evening. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the city manager if she has any announcements. City manager Storley. I can't really hear you, Erica. I, I saw, I read your lips and you said you don't have any, but I couldn't really hear you. Um, how about uh, Clerk Reed? My apologies. Yes, I have uh, a few announcements. Uh, first, I want to go to uh, announcements from uh, residents. Um, just received one email or two emails, but one just a second ago. So let me... Uh, pull both of those up and then we can uh, get those onto the record. Uh, we have one from a, um, a T Christian, uh, a Tiffany Christian who lives in the fourth ward, uh, who is unable to attend city council uh, this evening, but wanted to provide public comment. Um, and uh, Ms. Christian would like to say, uh, would like for the city council to commit to diverting funds from the police into alternative institutions uh, we have, you know, quote, we have too many police officers and their labor can be best put elsewhere, caring for our communities, educating our children, managing our natural resources, taking care of our streets and ecosystems. None of these are accomplished through a large police budget slash force. It seems that we have been pretty clear with, uh, with what we want, given the large demonstrations that have occurred in the aftermath of, the, of George Floyd's death. Our elected representatives, as our elected representatives, you have an obligation to heed our demands. So that was from uh, Tiffany Christian from the fourth ward. And then uh, I think this is Barbara Janes. Yes, it is Barbara Janes. Uh, this was sent a bit ago. And Miss Janes is uh, writing to the members of the city council. Uh, I'm writing to urge you take public action to insist that Northwestern take action to monitor off-campus student behavior, especially during the time of COVID-19. Um, Northwestern said that students off campus should not have uh, parties of more than 10 people. And if they do, there will be consequences. That's all well and good. But if the university is not 
present to observe these parties, they will go on and there will be no consequences. This poses a major risk to us living near off-campus student, uh, near off-campus student housing. Student parties seem to be a major source of COVID outbreaks on college campuses. NU um, does not have a well-designed testing protocol in place requiring off-campus students to be tested regularly and uh, facilities to quarantine those students uh, testing who have tested positive. <clears throat> Uh, the full comment uh, will be uh, sent to uh, the council. Um, then uh, next, I have uh, just a few announcements from the clerk's office. As we know, um, the November elections are underway, as well as our elections for the November, uh, our November elections are underway, as well as our municipal elections. Uh, we're going to start with a bit of information about the November 3rd elections. Uh, so we all know that election day is November 3rd and you will vote at your local polling place. Um, and that we hopefully know early voting will start October 19th through November 2nd. Uh, here in Evanston, you can early vote at the Lorraine H. Morton Civic Center, uh, 2100 Ridge and room G300. Um, and a list of the uh, operating hours is available on our website under the election information page. Um, most weekdays uh, or, or weekdays, the center is open until 7 p.m. Um, and on weekends until 5 p.m. Uh, we're also encouraging uh, folks to do a mixture of, of early voting. If you are healthy enough and you are in a lower risk category, uh, we certainly do not want to overwhelm the uh, postal service, although uh, there's a great indication that um, here locally we're, we're fine with our postmaster. Um, so, but if you do want to request a mail-in ballot, uh, you can do so by uh, visiting the county clerk's website, or you can give the clerk's office a ring and we can help you locate that form. Um, it's also available on our webpage. Uh, so we wanna make sure that folks uh, get in their uh, mail-in ballot request. Um, the mail-in ballots are gonna be uh, some commonly asked questions or you know, um, you know, when am I gonna receive my mail-in ballot? Uh, what we've gotten from the county clerk's office is that uh, they're going to be mailing out the uh, vote by mail ballots on a rolling basis. Um, I think they have already begun sending those out. Um, and folks, uh, you know, if you haven't received it and it's late October, reach out to the Evanston clerk's office or the county clerk's office, and we can help you figure out what's going on. You'll also be able to uh, cast a provisional ballot during early voting or on election day if for some reason you have an issue with your mail-in ballot. Uh, and so the same thing goes if you receive a mail-in ballot and you choose that you want to vote in person, uh, you have the option of, you know, submitting that mail-in ballot uh, via a Dropbox uh, that will be outside of the Civic Center during early voting. Um, and so you can drop it off in that Dropbox during early voting hours. Um, as well as, you know, you can walk into the early vote center and drop it off um, there. Um, and just I want to remind voters that as long as you get your mail-in voter, your mail-in ballot uh, posted by election day here in Illinois, your ballot will be counted. You know, we want to recommend that folks, you know, get it off a couple of days before the deadline, which is election day. But, you know, if you do get it in on election day, your vote will be counted here in Illinois. Um, so that's uh, our, those are our updates for the uh, November elections. Um, and all of this information, as I said, is on our city clerk's webpage under election information. Um, secondly, we have our uh, mayoral and aldermanic and clerk races coming up. Uh, the clerk's office uh, has on under reports and presentations a, a page on our under the city clerk's tab. You can find uh, all of the information you need uh, or much of the information you need for filing for the 2021 uh, municipal elections. Um, we also have a video that will be linked to our to this reports and presentation page as well that walks through uh, the stuff that we can we can tell you. The clerk's office uh, cannot give folks uh, legal advice, and but we we are working to be um, as transparent as possible to give folks as much information as as we can um, to make sure that everyone who wants to get on the ballot uh, can get on the ballot. 
So that ends um, my report for today. Great, thank you, thank you, Clerk Reed. Um, we didn't at the top of the meeting uh, just move a motion as we have been doing since the pandemic to have this meeting virtually. Uh, so Alderman Wilson, can you move that motion, please? Sure, I move that we uh, suspend our rules to conduct the meeting utilizing the Zoom software in light of the ongoing pandemic and pursuant to the governor's prior executive orders. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, City Clerk, can you please take the roll on that motion? Yes. Alderman Rainey? On mute, Am. Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Braithwaite? I'm sorry, he's not here. Uh, Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Suffredin? Aye. And Alderman Ravel? Aye. All right, thank you. On an eight to zero vote, the city council uh, approved having this meeting virtually. Uh, we're now gonna move in into public comment. We have uh, 14 people that have signed up for public comment. Per our rules, we set aside a uh, total of 45 minutes, no more than three minutes per person. So given the number that we have today, everyone will get up to three minutes if they need it. Uh, I will uh, name off uh, the first three speakers and then we'll continue to do that uh, so you know when you're up in the lineup. Uh, first up, we've got Linda Del Bosque, then Judith Siegel, then Carl Klein. Welcome. Welcome, Linda. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Devon, for keeping our city updated with information for the upcoming elections, both national and city. Um, I am very appalled, and I'm sure as many community members are, uh, but speaking for myself, very embarrassed on how the city of Evanston's projected on a national level with recorded YouTube you know, sessions, particularly the last one with the ethics and Wysocki being the attorney for the city of Evanston and the ethics um, board. The way she spoke to Devon was disgusting. It was embarrassing and disgusting. I am not sure if you actually, if you vet these attorneys or not, but I'm hoping that my money and our community members' money do not go back in to having her represent the ethics board again. It's appalling. And who represent, who was a pro tem that appointed the ethics, the commission board, because there's not one Latino or one black person on that board. They're all old white people. And how many old white people have to represent issues that have to, that actually project to discrimination and transparency? City of Evanston's done with old white people. We're progressive people, no matter what nationality you are. And we need to look at that as we go into our city elections. Progressive people with progressive thoughts, innovative ways, and being able to be transparent. So I'm not sure who the pro tem was who appointed the commission board, but I'm very disappointed as many others are. And if another person speaks like that to another person, a person of color, we're misrepresenting the city of Evanston. But if that's what you want to look like on YouTube on a national level, that's on you guys. Let's play better. I asked y'all that last year in fourth quarter. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so next up, we've got Judith Siegel, Carl Klein, then Lindsey Wade. Do we have Judith? All right, we're going to come back to Judith um, Siegel. We'll come back to her at the end since she doesn't seem to be on now. How about Carl Klein, Lindsey Wade, then Molly uh, Hartenstein? Welcome, Carl. Hello. Um, thank you for amending the um, agenda for the meeting to comply with city code. As a city that often talks about transparency, it's great to offer the citizens of Evanston at least um, some idea of what will be discussed in executive session. So thank you for 
amending the agenda to state that tonight's executive session will talk about litigation and personnel matters. Um, just a reminder, as you, as you all are full, fully aware, no final actions can be taken during the executive session. So um, I would hope to see that whatever is discussed in the executive session tonight uh, um, is placed on an agenda for a future city council for final action. Um, secondly, um, the census is uh, reportedly going to be finishing up uh, enumeration on September 30th. Thank you, Robin Rue Simmons, for all of your efforts to try to get the fifth ward counted. Um, also, I've been noticing that downtown Evanston, which is mostly in the first ward, the census track um, is down. Is that because Northwestern students um, are no longer living in the city, um, are not filling out their, um, their census, um, stating that that's where they were living in April. Um, Judy Fisk, if you could please work with this, uh, Northwestern University to determine if those really are Northwestern students not filling out the census, that'd be great because you are the chair of the university committee. So um, thank you. And I, I really look forward to um, having everyone in Evanston County because as you know, we can get a lot of money from this federal government. And so we need to make sure that all Evanstonians are counted. So thank you and have a nice evening. Indeed, thank, thank you, Carl. And thank you for uh, being an ambassador for the census, which is, as you mentioned, critically important. Uh, next up, we've got Lindsey Wade, then Molly Hartenstein, Stein, and then Mary Rosinski. Is Lindsey with us? All right, not hearing from Lindsay, we'll jump over to Molly. I know Molly's with us, I see Molly. Welcome, Molly. Hi, uh, my name is Molly Hartenstein. I'm a resident of the fourth ward. Um, I wanted to speak tonight about the ongoing efforts to defund the Evanston Police Department. Um, after moving the issue of defunding the Evanston Police Department to the Health and Human Services Committee, the aldermen who make up that committee have decided to allocate $200,000 in the upcoming 2021 budget to an alternative to police program. This $200,000, as per city manager Erica Storley, will come from the Health and Human Services Fund or a tax levy on Evanston residents. Modeling this program after cahoots and other programs in place in municipalities around the country, Alderman explained that a social worker will be on call to join police officers and responding to 911 calls when 911 dispatchers determine they are necessary, it will be safe for them to do so. While this new program recognizes the need for community safety beyond policing, it is not equivalent to defunding. Defunding is a reallocation of police funds to other parts of the city budget in an attempt to redistribute limited city resources. Without a change to the police budget or cutting police equipment, expenses, and even personnel, there is no way to defund the police department. The reason I'm emphasizing the need to cut actual dollars from the police budget and not simply take funds from other sectors of the city budget or increase taxes is because the police are already overfunded and other funds are underfunded. The Health Fund, Community Development Fund, and Parks and Rec Fund employ fewer people combined and receive less funds combined each year than the police budget. However, the police department has a lower revenue to expenditure ratio than the Community Development and Parks and Rec funds, meaning that every dollar put into the police fund has lower returns than investing the money elsewhere. The problem of anti-black bonds in the police force cannot be solved through higher taxes or shifting tax dollars away from already underfunded government sectors. It must begin with defunding the Evanston Police Department. In a city that is already losing its black residents to ever increasing property taxes, money for new programs must be taken from existing funds that don't need it. There is no way to ethically distribute taxpayer dollars in the upcoming budget that doesn't cut police funding. We have demanded that city council defund the police to ensure the safety and well-being of all Evansonians. Limiting the power of police officers to physically control black and brown people through stricter oversight is one aspect of this fight. But the other is constructing new life-affirming community building initiatives, not at the expense of taxpayers or existing programs, but at the expense of a police department that is not filling its duty to protect and serve Evanstonians. Lastly, I urge all the members of city council, all city of Evanston employees on this call and everyone hearing me speak right now, to take some time to read Evanston Fight for Black Lives, defunding the Evanston Police Department Plan of Action. All of the arguments I've made here tonight are expanded upon that packet and a model for how to defund and restructure the police department is explained in detail. Four requested commitments are included as well, namely defunding EPD by 
creating a subcommittee of all Dominican citizens to implement the model by September 21st, for that committee to have weekly meetings, and for that committee to have access to any EPD complaints and records they may ask for. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Molly. All right, next up, we've got Mary Rosinski, then Mike Vasilko, then Nick Davis. Welcome, Mary. Is Mary with us? All right, not hearing from Mary, we're gonna to move to Mike. So welcome, welcome Mike. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> so if, if, it, if it weren't for uh, hearing from Carl, I wouldn't have known that you updated the agenda for the executive session. I mean, I looked at the agenda tonight's meeting uh, on Friday and printed it out on Friday. And then I wrote a note asking what the agenda was for the executive session. I got no response. I mean, we shouldn't have to go back to the city website every day or twice a day to see if there's been any updates. Uh, no one responded to my email. I didn't know what the issues were. I really don't know what the issue is other than I hear now something about litigation. So it'd be nice if the mayor or somebody would explain in more detail what the um, agenda for that meeting is. I uh, also asked about the city manager's search and what the status of that is, or is that part of the executive session? I also asked uh, when the citizens or if the citizens will see the full list of city manager candidates because we're entitled to see the full list and all of their credentials. I also asked on Friday, uh, when will all departments be put through the same ringer as uh, the police department when it comes to scrutinizing their budget, uh, I just heard somebody say the police were overfunded. I, I, I don't know how any one citizen can make that kind of comment because how do we know that? Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, so we'd like to see when other departments are going to be scrutinized for their budgets. Uh, not talking about social programs because we know those only need to increase in budget, but uh, there are a lot of departments within the city that could easily be cut. Um, I also stated at the time again and again and again that the terms defunding uh, should be withdrawn from the conversation because it's really a budget issue, not a defunding issue, uh, which is a, um, I find to be a demoralizing uh, term that penalizes the police department for no cause. I've heard speakers from the Evanston for Black Lives mention in their presentations that the funding is only the first step, abolishing is the ultimate goal. So I think there needs to be some real hard thought put into that. Lastly, if the proposed change to the emergency response system is being considered and there was a placeholder suggested for next year's budget. Uh, that really needs to be a referendum. This whole issue about changing how the police department operates or if it does uh, change and uh, the emergency response uh, program, everybody in Evanston needs to know about that, not just 30 or 40 uh, repeat speakers like me uh, making comments in that regard. And also lastly, uh, I don't think Hitesh is on the phone or on the call, uh, but I've asked repeatedly why my FOIA request uh, to identify the total city debt as of August of this year has not been responded to. Um, should be simple. They sent me a December 2019 document, which is eight months out of due, uh, eight months old and, and the document I already know I'd like to see that FOIA responded to, or I have no alternative but to reply to the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And Erica, if you can just look into that FOIA request. Um, and for anyone watching, again, the primary business tonight, it's gonna to be executive session and recessing into it. And it's gonna be on two matters, a, a litigate, litigation matter and personnel matters tonight. So that's the, uh, the topics for uh, executive session. We're going to move to our next speaker, uh, who's Nick Davis. And then after Nick, we're going to have 
Adam Marquette, and then Sean Peck Collier. So welcome, Nick. Everybody can hear me good? We can, yep. All right, <clears throat> so what many community organizers, academics, and other proponents of defunding have predicted is unfolding before our eyes in Evanston. Uh, politicians, police, and lawyers, among other city employees, have learned the lingo and appropriated terms born out of decades of studying and struggle. Words like reimagine and defund and weaponize them to fit their own agendas or in an effort to compromise. Unfortunately, there's no compromising when it comes to fixing a system that is literally killing black and brown people of all gender, sexualities, and abilities, trapping us in a cycle of perpetual generational trauma at the hands of police, reinforced through contracts agreed upon by city officials that make it almost impossible to hold them accountable and out them from our communities when they break our trust and violate our rights. We're telling you what's wrong. We're telling you how we'd like to see it fixed and it's being ignored. A lot of people on this call still talk about they're not really understanding how this would be possible. And EFBL has put out a very thorough 27 page packet on how that happens. Um, and that's in addition to other meetings that we've all had different organizers and different community members and different people that are just interested in this have had. And the reaction from a lot of people in the city, not necessarily everybody on this call, but it, Hey, Nick. We can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you, Nick. Something happened. Um, it's oh, there, you are. There, there you go. Okay. Do I, do I need to repeat anything? We lost you after people on this call, but not everybody. Then I lost you. I was just saying that there's there's a lot of resources out there that people have been trying to invite people onto and it just haven't been well responded to. But I have another resource I'd like to share if I could get... Um, if I could access the chat or I could email to people later. It's a letter from the Social Service Workers United, which is an organization that's based in Chicago of all different social workers across the country, but it's based here. And they have an open letter as well as a lot of other resources that tell people why pairing a social worker and a cop is not the ideal situation, not only from uh, the point of view of defunding, but just from their social work perspective, that's not something that they would prefer to do. Um, so I would encourage everybody to take a look at that when they can. Um, is everybody still hearing me okay or am I still skipping out? We're, we're hearing you. We hear you. Okay. Um, but yeah, so in addition to that, our own victim services employees have told city officials on record that with more resources, the department, which has been cut significantly for the last several years, but that if they had more resources, they'd be able to fulfill a lot of community needs without supplementing EPD's budget and without the oversight of police officers on a large number of calls. That type of thing is also addressed in this letter that I'll email to people. Um, and last, I just want to say there's, well, not lastly, second last, there's room for everyone in Evanston to do better for our city, myself included. But I just wanted to be clear that we wouldn't be here talking about what we're talking about right now without uh, the work of a lot of different black and brown activists and organizers in Evanston who are just tired of waiting for elected officials. You broke up. I lost you again. I lost you again there, Nick. Looks like you're froze. This kind of embodies, I think, a problem that we've seen in the very recent past in Evanston where we've had uh, settlements go to former city employees for racial discrimination. And um, if you can't see how this is reminiscent of that, I think we should all kind of like take a picture, take a pause, and make sure we don't go down the same path because we're all talking here, talking about budget, talking about money, and wasting money because people are being racist and just don't want to admit it and change their ways is something that we shouldn't have to waste taxpayer dollars on. And it's pretty unacceptable. So that's how I wanted to end it. And thank you very much for the public comment time. Thank you, Nick. And Nick, if you want to send that document that you have that you want to share to the city clerk, he can put it into the into the record and share it with the council. Okay. All right. So thank you, Nick. Um, next up, we've got Adam Marquette, then Sean Peck Collier, then Sharon Kushner. Uh, Adam, welcome. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Marquardt. I'm a resident of Seventh Ward. First, I'd like to express my support for Clerk Reed and his ongoing efforts to make transparent the operations of the city of Evanston and to voice my, dis to voice my distaste at the continued suppression of his work as a voice for the citizens of Evanston. Uh, but the primary reason that I'm commenting is in response to the Health and Human Services decision to allocate $200,000 to provide social workers who will accompany police officers on a call. I echo uh, Nick's points. Uh, that letter I think is very persuasive. And I think that everyone in the city government and everyone on this call should read it. Um, and uh, like Molly said, while this new program recognizes the need for community safety beyond policing, it is not equivalent to the funding. A commitment to defunding the police requires recognition that police exist to protect property and not to prevent harm. 
Manifold studies have confirmed there is no correlation between crime rates and the number of police officers. You can look at Oxford scholar David Bailey's book, Police for the Future, which uh, you know enumerates all the evidence for that. The Evanston Police Department, like all police departments, is an institution that deepens racial hierarchies and endangers the lives of Evanstonians. Since 2016, nearly 80% of cases where an officer uses force, it is the officer that initiated the force. And in 60% of those cases, the victim is black. Evanston's population is less than 20% black, but 60% of the time when a police officer attacks a civilian without physical provocation, the victim is black. Evanston residents are being terrorized and only a decrease in patrol operations will prevent that violence. We need, like Evanston Fight for Black Lives has demanded, a 75% net reduction in, Ev in the Evanston Police Department's budget. Uh, excuse me. We need to put that money into, into departments that yield a higher revenue yield, like community development and parks and recreation. That in turn generates more money, which can be used to pay off our deficit, expand reparations, and even pay for programs that address the root cause of the situation so that our officers are called to deal with and that they so often mishandle. We need a jobs guarantee in the city. We need a higher minimum wage. We need well-maintained public housing. We need to expand access to counseling and medical care. We need to decriminalize addiction. These are all empirically proven solutions to the same public safety concerns that the mayor and the police department use to justify the EPD's existence and to resist calls for defunding. This ever cannot be the end of the city's work to reduce and ultimately eliminate our reliance on police. Amending police procedure is also not the solution. The Kenosha Police Department, where Jacob Blake, a member of, of our community, was shot, boasts very similar practices, very similar, quote unquote, progressive policing uh, efforts that Evanston likes to brag about, yet uh, they are woefully inequipped to prevent or even address this anti-Black violence and are, in fact, a major perpetrator of it. Uh, and also quickly, just to respond to Mike's comment, he asked, how do we know the police are overfunded? How can any one of us know that? Yet he says that he doesn't think that's the solution. Uh, I can provide several several definitions of the word overfunded that would indicate that our police department is such. You can look at comparisons to Illinois cities with similar populations and see that Evanston stands atop those cities with a much higher police budget without much better results. You could also understand overfunded as a discrepancy between how much money we put into the, into the department and a lack of positive results that we're seeing. Any department with such a prolific record of violence against its residents should be limited in its operations while we develop alternative solutions. And again, I urge everyone here to read Evanston Fight for Black Lives plan for defunding. Uh, the link is tinyurl.com slash defunding POA. Uh, it's 27 pages of work that they have done for the city government to just explain how you can meet the city citizens demands. Um, I think it's incredibly effective and persuasive. And I think it is the obligation of all city officials uh, and residents who have not looked at it yet to actually, you know, engage with that uh, paper. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, I want to recognize that Alderman Braithwaite joined us and city clerk, if we could just have the record uh, reflect that he's now uh, with us. Uh, next speaker is Sean Peck Collier, then Sharon Kushner, and then Alex Piper. Welcome, Sean. Uh, good evening, all our folks. Uh, I, I want to amplify everything that Adam just said. Um, I'm with Mike Visoko on this, at least. Uh, the city of Evanston has been less than transparent with its citizens. Certainly the last minute update today to today's agenda, but also that the ethics committee uh, last Wednesday was not on the city calendar until just before it began. And we've also been having many problems with the FOIA officers that Mayor Haggerty and the city council has appointed in lieu of uh, Clerk Reed with our freedom of information requests. So if we can do something about that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, there are many of us that have Black Lives Matter signs on our front lawn. I'm sure that's the case for some of our older people. On our city website, our city council has even put up goals, goals like expanding affordable housing options or ensuring equity in all city operations and stated organiza uh, organizational values such as integrity and accountability. I look at the city's history in dealing with its marginalized city workers. Suzette Robinson, whom the city spent close to a million dollars of our taxpayer money to end a racial discrimination case. Kevin Brown, who they removed for, uh, with the same firm they used to defend against Suzette Robinson under the pretense that he had used a city card to pay for three city tickets that were placed on city vehicles, which was not actually an uncommon thing for city employees to do. And now, Clerk Reed. 
I don't know how many of the council folks were there during the ethics board meeting, but I do know that they did and said nothing when Mayor Haggerty and his lawyer spent around an hour trying to prevent Clerk Reed from presenting his ethics case and saying that Clerk Reed only had political interests. I know that they said nothing when the advising counsel for the ethics board, Yordana Waisaki, spoke with such disrespect and condescension as she interrupted, spoke over, and did her best to silence Clerk Reed and take as many opportunities to advise actions that put obstacles between the committee and being able to consider the case before them. Was this integrity? Was what I saw in pursuit of accountability and transparency? How much of our tax dollars did our city pay for such an embarrassing show of ethics? And then I look back at Mayor Haggerty's last Q&A on policing, when we heard from three brave young black men as they described the trauma that they suffered at the hands of police as children. All they got was an apology. I can only imagine that these experiences are the very top of the iceberg, since EPD's own dashboard is full of over 100 arrests of juveniles and over 100 stops and frisks of our children. I have to wonder how much the city, uh, the city council is truly working towards safety for everyone, but especially our black and brown neighbors, when we know that black drivers are being pulled over nearly nine times the amount that white drivers are, when we know that our black uh, and brown neighbors are being stopped and patted down far more than our white neighbors without actually finding as much, when we know that over the past four years, black and brown people have received nearly 70% of all use of force and 68% of, uh, of the time um, our officer, like once our officers arrived, they were first to initiate violence. We know that our police don't count pointing their firearms at anyone as a use of force and so don't have to report it. We also know that Northwestern- uh, Sean, I'm, Sean, we're at the three minutes. Can you just wrap up in the next 10 seconds? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we also know that Northwestern has accounted for more than 20% of all pedestrian stops in Evanston. So we can be sure to f that if we transfer funds from EPD budget, we've got someone picking up the slack. Uh, earlier this year, in the middle of a pandemic, our city approved uh, $800,000 for trees. Trees. And we're offering our black and brown neighbors 200000 without touching our police department. 800000 for trees, 200000 for people. I have to ask, do black lives really matter in Evanston? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got Sharon Kushner, Alex Piper, then Claire Kelly. Hi, I'm Sharon Kushner, a resident of the Sixth Ward. Tonight, I wanted to share two concerns I have. Number one, last week I witnessed Luke Stowe remove, remove three members of the public from the Ethics Committee meeting. It is my understanding, although it was hard to be sure of what exactly was happening on Zoom during all of the objections and counter objections, that these members of the public were speaking out during times other than during public comment. It's my understanding that this occasionally happens as a protest during physical city meetings and members are not forcibly removed from those meetings. Luke Stowe's virtual removal of these persons was a violation of the Open Meetings Act, something that the mayor is accusing Devon Reed of violating. I trust Mayor Haggerty will be holding Luke Stowe accountable for his violations last week and that these violations will not be repeated in future meetings. I understand mute can be applied without having to remove someone from a meeting. I've also noticed that members of the public cannot change their name on Zoom in this meeting today, which is why I cannot add my last name. Turning this feature off may be more uncomfortable for the city administration and aldermen who don't want people to use their names as a means of protest, but blocking name changes to block protest is just petty and potentially another violation of the Open Meeting Act. Number two, I am concerned that the human services meeting was canceled for tomorrow night. Can someone please explain why and when this meeting will be rescheduled? We certainly have a lot to discuss as the budget process is beginning this week and no steps have yet been taken to reallocate money from the police department budget to human services and the other city departments. The Evanston Police Department's budget accounts for 35% of the city's general fund expenses. We are in a deficit and the city has proposed selling off city assets to help alleviate the shortfall. 
in any regard, this is not a sustainable response to addressing fiscal shortages. In lieu of bartering social goods, a sensible and nonpartisan alternative choice would be to reallocate the city's largest expenditure, the EPD's budget. Reallocating money just makes fiscal sense. Why pay more money to fix the problem after it's happened than to prevent the problem in the first place? Cahoots, which has had 30 years of success in Eugene and Springfield, Oregon, requires only 2.5 million to function for two cities. The two alternative police departments that Mayor Haggerty interviewed in his Q&A, Olympia CRU and Denver CIRU, requires a budget of 600,000 and 1 million respectively in order to function well. The 200,000 that Evanston has so far committed to these efforts makes it seem like our city just wants an alternative program to fail before it has a chance. It needs more funding, real funding, and this funding needs to come from the police department. A CAHOOTS program costs money, but it is proven to save money in the long run. Let's do both the fiscally responsible thing as well as what is best for the quality of life for all people in Evanston. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sharon. Uh, all right, next up we've got Alex Piper, then Claire Kelly, then Darlene Cannon. Welcome, Alex. Hi, I'm a 20 year resident of the third ward. Um, I've had the privilege of sitting in on hours of Zoom calls this summer, learning along with so many of you. It is now very clear that the Evanston Police Department has been responsible for more services than they should have been asked to do. It is also clear from the data on 911 calls that an armed uniformed police person is not the best person to handle many of the calls they respond to. It is equally clear that the historical inequality of police engagement across race without sufficient oversight has left too many black and brown residents feeling unsafe. Over these weeks, we've been reintroduced to many of our very strong nonprofit agencies and have learned about the incredible work they're all doing. We've also been reintroduced to our youth and family services team and heard an impassioned requests from them for more resources and more staff to expand the holistic work they are already doing with our youth. We now all know about successful alternatives to police response models in Eugene, Denver, and Olympia. To me, this path to broaden our awareness was leading to the direction of defunding the police. We were primed to reimagine and reallocate social service resources from the existing punitive police-driven model to one centered on relationship building that is preventative and heals root issues. Yet even with all this positive knowledge and energy, something keeps bumping up against this path forward, fear. Specifically the fear that decreasing our police department will result in a spike in violence and theft. This fear is currently by Trump and as this intentional bellowing for law and order has been a politically successful strategy for decades to create othering and divide us further. Yet we know that increased police does not make us safer. We have seen how alternatives to police intervention can help create opportunities and resources that actually increase community safety. But we are Evanston. Although Evanston is not guiltless of perpetuating racial inequities and structural racism, we have a committed community who have often forged brave paths, to and I'd like to highlight a few examples. The June 2019 resolution that acknowledged Evanston's history of racially motivated policies and practices and committed to eradicating the effects of racist past practices. The November 2019 creation of a reparations program, the first in the nation, that secured funding from cannabis tax revenue. And certainly not least of all, the dedication of Evanston youth this summer, tirelessly organizing and advocating in groups like Evanston Fights for Black Lives Matter and defunding, defunding EPD. While I am optimistic that we are starting a task force to envision this new pilot alternative responder program, it cannot stop there. As was cited by one of the city partners, Connections, the, ear, the earmarked 200,000 represents a mere 0.02, I'm sorry, 0.0625% of the proposed 2021 budget. I understand the budget is especially tight now, but we need to continue to look for additional funding to be reallocated from the ETB, EPD for the program to succeed. In the June New York Times Magazine cover story titled, What is Owed? The author, Nicole Hannes Jones warns, if we are truly at the precipice of a transformative moment, the most tragic of outcomes would be that the demand be too timid and the resolution too small. If we are indeed serious, serious about creating a more just society, we must go further than that. We must get to the root of it. I urge the mayor, the police department, and the city council to continue this 
the pace of this critical work. As a next step, I ask you to bring these discussions directly to our residents, centering them in black and brown communities that have been disproportionately affected by decades of disinvestment and structural racism. Excuse me. Thank, thank, thank you, Alex. I, just my last sentence. Only then can we all come together and reimagine shared safety. Thank you all for your work and for your time. Thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, next up, we've got Claire Kelly, Darlene Cannon, and then Alec Avery is our last speaker tonight. Claire? Hi, Claire Kelly from the First Ward. And first, I'd like to echo some of the concerns of Barbara James. Um, I really do hope that our city officials and our representatives are sitting at the table with Northwestern to secure explicit um, assurances that Northwestern is taking every measure and getting it in writing to um, to really um, address any potential risk of any potential increased risk of COVID um, with students. So whether they're on campus or off campus, I hope we're not just saying, oh, you know, I hope we're actually sitting down with them and getting that in writing for our residents so that we can, um, so that we know what is what what measures are being taken. I think that that is um, something we need to do with Northwestern. Um, I'm also concerned when I saw the agenda today, litigation really, I mean, I'm just hoping that our representatives up are really scrutinizing every decision to go forward and spend yet more tax dollars on litigation. Um, and this really concerns me. Um, and, you know, this Robin Schwartz firm that we've hired now, it seems that they've been hired exclusively to investigate and challenge for only black employees. This is, this is problematic, to say the least. Um, yeah, I just... And, and the hearing the other day, I did watch the ethics hearing, and I also want to echo concerns I heard. Um, I don't know how, you know, the attorney Wysocki was Howard, um, hired and what instructions and directions she was given, but her presentation truly made a mockery of any semblance of an independent or objective ethics board. I mean, she was clearly on, you know, representing Mayor Haggerty. I mean, there was no doubt she she scoffed, she made fun, she laughed at Clerk Reed. I mean, it was just abominable. I mean, I really, truly, I don't know how this could happen. <laughs> anyway, that was horrendous, and I and I'd like to find like to know who instructed her and gave her that sort of direction to to carry on that way. Um, and finally, I am also very concerned with the inordinate, incredibly inordinately high per capita expenditure of Evanston with regard to our police department. Um, compare with other cities across the nation of similar demographic and population, and you'll see that we are really, we, we are spending far more than, than comparable cities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got Darlene Cannon and then Alec Avery. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we want all oppressive systems dismantled and defunded. That includes Evanston's police department. Those funds must be reallocated to assist the citizens of Evanston. We must also expose Mayor Haggerty's abuse of power by using our tax dollars to attack Clerk Reed. And Haggerty has spent thousands of our dollars to pay outside counsel to run to run our ethics board, to invest a clerk, and even attack private citizens and attempt to silence them. Yordana Wasaki was hired by the city and paid 50K thus far at the last ethics hearing, and she did not maintain impartial judgment, and she is a disgrace to the city council and the residents of Evanston. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Next up, uh, Alec Avery. Uh, I had two accounts because I'm using a different device. Can you guys hear me? We can. Welcome. Yep. Um, first of all, I guess I just want to say thank you to all the black and brown activists that have done so much in Evanston on the task of defunding and figuring out all the details that it seems like our city is very reluctant to work on. Um, and I guess I just want to emphasize, I, I was at that ethics board meeting and I want to agree with what people were saying about how disturbing it was to see how Wazaki treated um, Devon Reed. And I, I was one of the people who was kicked out of the meeting and it, 
I hadn't even like said anything really. Like, I think that it was by accident that I got kicked out. And it was just like, I got kicked out for basically nothing. Like it, it just seems ridiculous. Not only how little this government right now, at least some people in the government aren't willing to like listen to our constituents. Like our constituents are saying very clearly, like their needs, uh, our needs. And I, I guess I don't even, I don't even know what it is that's preventing some people in power, Mayor Haggerty, from caring about these issues and listening. But it needs to change. And if you're not going to change, we need someone new. We need somebody who cares about our residents. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. All right, that wraps up uh, public comment this evening. So thank you everybody for coming out and sharing your opinion and your perspective on different issues around Evanston. Uh, we're now going to move to, um, uh, I don't actually have the agenda. Oh, from Mayor Haggerty, before you do that, can I just clarify um, about this subcommittee that's going to be meeting um, in case people aren't here when I give public comment? Sure, sure. Um, so just for those who are here and interested in the policing matter. So as you know, we for I think four weeks, human services met to have a discussion on these things. And we did decide to go to a subcommittee. A subcommittee will allow for a deeper conversation as well as bringing in other people from the community to participate. Um, so I volunteered to be the chair of the subcommittee. Um, the subcommittee is being formed. It will go to hum not human services, it will go to city council um, for formal approval with the subcommittee member names. And then they will be held obviously on Zoom and be open to the public to participate. Um, the comment regarding the $200,000, that was something that at least myself, I think other subcommittee members learned that on our last call that um, interim manager Storley had kind of earmarked some money. Um, that is just one piece of money that we can use if we decide to use that piece of money. There has been no decision on that being the maximum or that there will not be money from other sources that we would use for whatever program we put together. There has also not been a decision that the program will be designed you know, solely after anything that we talked about or that there will be a police officer and a social worker as the, um, the staff members that go out to whatever calls are needed. So I think we just want to make some, put some clarity around there that what we did in human services is what we always do, which is have a lot of discussion. This needs a lot more discussion, so we're going to take it off to a subcommittee that focuses only on this. Um, and then no decisions will be made until that subcommittee, you know, makes a recommendation and it comes back to city council. So just want to make sure that everyone is very clear that no decisions have been made. Lots of things have been talked about, but anything that is decided will be decided with input from citizens, you know, via the subcommittee and then with decisions um, in a vote at city council. Um, and then human services was canceled because we only decided to have human services weekly to discuss this one item. We did not have anything else on the agenda for a meeting this month. And so we are going to put together the subcommittee and then that subcommittee will begin to meet. Human services will resume again in October um, with any items that come up that need to be discussed in the human services um, task force. And then lastly, I think there was some kind of comment about a 25 page report. Um, my suggestion would be if anyone has something they want city council to see, you should email that to us. We don't, I'm not going to remember any email address you give me here or website. So um, if you all would like us to look at things, those things should be emailed to us so we can address them. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Fleming. And uh, for the public and the city council, I'm working with Alderman Fleming and we're going to bring to you uh, recommendations for that subcommittee on the, um, I think it's September 24th or September 28th, that Monday uh, meeting. We'll have it then on the agenda for everyone. We're now going to move to call the wards. Uh, we'll start with Alderman Fisk. All right, I don't see Alderman Fisk right now, so she may have uh, had to step away for a second. How about Alderman uh, Braithwaite? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this Thursday, I believe it's six o'clock, we're hosting uh, another second ward meeting. Topics will be uh, our safety report from PST Officer Napier, uh, update on Harvard Park to include the renaming of the park, as well as uh, our interim city manager 
Erica Storley will be there to give us an overview on the budget process. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alderman. But Alderman Wynn? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, just a short report to offer my sincere condolences to the Weaver family mm -hmm. uh, at this terrible time. Uh, I really appreciate all of the contributions, and there are so many that their family has made to Evanston, uh, and my deepest sympathy to all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Wilson. If I, oh, yeah, this, go ahead, if go I ahead, can, Alderman, Alderman Wilson, my, my, my apologies, I wasn't here at the top of the meeting as, as well on behalf of all the residents of the second ward, uh, sending our condolences to both Clarence and Wendy Weaver and the Weaver family and close friends of their son, CJ. Um, there will be a service, I believe this Thursday at Second Baptist, it's gonna be closed to family, but there are instructions and I'll share them through our ward newsletter on how to send your condolences and contribute to a fund that's been set up in their son's name. Thank you. Alderman. Alderman Wilson. Um, I just want to join my colleagues uh, also in extending my condolences to the Weaver family. And, All right. And, thank you. Thank oh. you. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Um, again, with my colleagues on city council, condolences, prayers, strength, love to the entire Weaver family. Uh, we are here with you. Uh, we have our ward meeting tomorrow, 7 p.m. It is on Zoom. A newsletter should go out. Um, tomorrow morning with the details confirmed of uh, the agenda. And thank you to all of those that have um, followed the uh, reparation uh, process, our meetings, and taken the time to be educated. I just want to um, state that there is a reparation website where you can go and get the facts and the details and actually add any um, suggestions or input. It is uh, cityofevanston.org backs backslash uh, reparations. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alderman. Alderman Safford? Uh, condolences to your family and then nothing else. Nothing, okay. Um, Alderman Ravel. Uh, joining my colleagues in sending my condolences as well to the Weaver family. And um, just a heads up about a seventh ward meeting on the calendar for the 22nd of September. Okay, thank you, Alderman. Alderman Rainey? All right, I don't see Alderman Rainey. Uh, Alderman Fleming? Oh, maybe Alderman Rainey's coming back. I stepped out of the room. Okay. Um, yeah. I had a call I had to make. Are we at call of the wards? Are we going we are, into executive we are, session? We are We are at call of the wards right now, Ann. But not going into executive session? Right? We're, we're, about to, we're about to. We're just wrapping it up. It's you and then okay. Alderman Fleming. All right. Well, I too then, um, I was going to save my comments till Call of the Wards, but since this is Call of the Wards, um, I, 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 I was uh, just heartbroken when I read about um, the Weaver son. And I too, I look forward to hearing um, information about how we can support the family. Um, and um, my condolences um, to them. Um, and also, I, I would like to um, express my thanks to um, Representative Sh uh, Congressman Schakowsky's office and Senator Durbin's office helping us with, and, and also Alderman Simmons, who's joined me, um, helping us uh, with the Evergreen Project on Howard Street. Um, we've been having some difficulty with uh, the, the DC office of HUD. Um, getting a piece of paper out of that office back to uh, the Housing Authority of Cook County, um, downtown Chicago. Um, it's It's been a really difficult, difficult process. And hopefully this week we will see um, see the, uh, the response. So anyway, just everybody's asking what's going on, what's going on, and we're waiting for a piece of paper. That's, that's what we're... <laughs> one piece of paper so thank you thank you all mayor Haggerty, i forgot a comment go, Sorry go ahead that. go ahead um just census and I, I know i always make census comments but it's really important i do want to give a little bit of encouragement we actually um have exceeded our reporting data from um 2010 but that's not our standard right we're exceptional evanston and we want to keep going 
um, census tract 8092 still is maybe as, as much as 10 points behind the average of the city. And as we know, that is a census tract that has a tremendous need um, for federal dollars. So please um, do share with everyone that you know in Evanston uh, to complete their census. I will try to have a census event on um, Friday. More details will come regarding that. Great, Th thank you for that PSA. Uh, and then we'll end us uh, with Alderman Fleming tonight. Thank you. I didn't realize you were doing call to the words first. I could have saved my announcement. Um, I will share with the condolences for the weavers, but I also want to add condolences to um, the friends and family of two young men who um, passed away in a car accident and they were connected to Evanston because they work at Kirk's Cafe. And so um, just our con my condolences to their families as well as the staff at Kirk's Cafe, who I know um, really try to support the young people they work with, as well as an um, ETHS alum who also passed away. Uh, last week in a car accident, um, just 20 years ago, there's been so many loss of young people who are connected to our city. So while the Weavers are well known and more, and I want to represent and um, offer condolences to so many other families who also have lost so many loved ones during this pandemic, particularly in a time when you can't gather and more. And I know that that's a, an, an additional hurt for people. Um, my other comment is that next Wednesday, and I guess we'll be announcing this as well, but there is a budget meeting at 630. So to all the residents of the ninth ward, I have moved our ward meeting till Thursday, the 17th. Um, and so making sure we can all get to the budget meeting on Wednesday, the 16th. And then as always, we will start to discuss the budget on the Thursday meeting, as well as just a couple of updates from around the community. So please make sure you tune in there. Um, and there'll be more information as well, just on my website. Great. Thank, thank you, Alderman Fleming. All right, Alderman Wilson, can you please read us into executive session? Sure. Pursuant to five Illinois compiled statutes, ILCS 120-2A, I move that the City Council convene into executive session to discuss agenda items regarding personnel and litigation. The agenda items are printed subjects to be considered in executive session and are enumerated exceptions under the Open Meetings Act. These exceptions are five ILCS 120-2A, C1, C11. Second. All right. Uh, City Clerk, can you please take the roll? Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Fleming. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Oh. Alderman Griffith. Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Aye. Alderman Sufferton. And Alderman Re and Alderman Ravel. Aye. And we didn't get Alderman Fisk. Yeah, and Alderman Suffering was an aye. So uh, on an eight to zero vote, the Evanston City Council is going to recess into executive session.